First of all, I decided that the title of my talk would be better as a subtitle, and the open sourcing science sounded more cool. Um, but they both mean the same thing, so. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about uh, making science research more open source, both from the angle of using open source tools in your research, and also making your research itself more open source. Um, that is my Twitter handle, if you do the Twitter thing. I do occasionally. Okay, so like uh, the, my, my wonderful introduction just mentioned, I work in a neuroscience research lab, and we study uh, ne neuroscience, we study auditory neuroscience using electrophysiology. So that means we kind of take recordings from the brain to try to figure out how the brain processes sound. And that is a picture of my lab. Um, but actually this was just, I stopped working there almost two weeks ago, so this is gonna be kind of like a wrap up, a bit of a presentation for me. Um, okay, so this is kind of a table of contents, so what I'm gonna talk about today are kind of, can be sorted into kind of three main categories. First I'm gonna be talking about reproducibility in science, and how we can improve that. And then I'm gonna start, um, then I'm gonna give some examples of using some open source packages, uh, and kind of my workflow. And then I'm also gonna talk about citizen science. Okay, I also wanna get out of the way a couple of definitions. And um, that is open science and open source because they're not quite the same thing. So open science is kind of an overarching um, idea that scientific research should be open and immediately shared. So this is the knowledge portion of it, basically. And open source is a practice of open and universal access to source code of software. So open source definitely has a part to play in open science. Um, because it has to do with the message and results of open science, but open science is kind of a, or, a greater idea as well, um, and it has a lot surrounding to do with publishing, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, it's like a whole big debate and talk to itself, um, open versus closed kind of publishing. Um, that's basically, if you don't know what that is, it's the type of journal you publish in, whether or not general people have access to it or whether it's behind a paywall, and most of the time it's behind a paywall, and the most, all the most prestigious journals are. Um, but that's a debate for another day. Okay. So, back in the days before the internet, um, scientists communicated, you know, by postal mail, by phone, uh, and the only way to get someone else's research information from it was to get mailed it. So, if you read about that there was an article somewhere, you would say, send the, the scientist a postcard, and they would send you back something that looked like this. Uh, this is from my lab. This is actually the last time we had a printed version of our articles, which was 2007. Um, and that's how you would, that's how would, you would um, get access to like the methods, for example, like how they did their experiment. So this portion here, you can't read it, but I've highlighted the entire methods section from this article. Um, and how many of you think you could reproduce an entire science experiment from that information, from a few paragraphs? Yeah, not a lot. Um, <laughs> And these are a couple of sentences, for example, like that have surrounding to do with the software. These are the only sentences um, that talk about software or where you can get it. I.e., you can't, they don't tell you where you can get it. It is, not, it is not posted online anywhere. It is basically just mentioned that there is some custom written software somewhere. Okay, but that was before like, the days of the internet. And, but you're, you're, and you're, you're limited by the size of things you can print. So that's, it's understandable that they have to keep things to a kind of a terse and you have to ask for more information. But we have the internet now. So with it, ushered in a new age of widespread and easy, easy sharing of tools and collaboration and it's all puppies and rainbows and reproducibility is not a problem. Except that didn't quite happen. And this puppy's sad about it. Because change is hard. Um, it's, it's not quite anyways. It definitely is better today and it's getting better, but still often the only way to get data or associated code is to contact a paper author directly and ask for it. And so we are kind of depending on there that they're going to A, write back, that they're going to B, still have it, um, and that they kind of, they're, they're, you're relying on their kind of goodwill and their spare time to help you out with that. Okay. So science has a reproducibility problem, and wh but why do we even care? Why do we care that we want to see this code anyways? Um, it's, oh, actually, I want to talk about, um, let's see. So why, so actually, why is it this way, actually? Um, so it's a matter of incentives. Scientists are typically based on the number of journals 
that they publish and the quality of those journals and not whether on whether the science is reproducible. So they have little uh, motivation to spend extra time doing the things like posting code online that'll make the science reproducible. And there was actually a 2012 study that looked at all the kind of top oncology papers and found that only 25% of those papers were able to be reproduced by the study conductors. And that is a problem. This is the science that we're basing off of our, uh, our, all our new innovations off of. Not to mention that it's publicly funded. So why should you care? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was actually another study as well that found very similar findings. I think it was actually less than 25%. It found like 10% initially, but then they did another stage where they contacted the, the paper authors and said, can you give us more information? They did. That number did, after doing that, go up to, say, 75. Okay. Um, but anyways, so why do we care about this? So ultimately, the scientific process is self-correcting. And with enough uh, testing, incorrect data will be discovered and disregarded. Um, and I'd like to point out that this isn't like um, the incorrect data isn't malicious stuff. There is very rare that people will fabricate data. And that's kind of a different issue. But when I'm talking about just like human error, mistakes are made, experiment, flawed experimental design, kind of general things that are just going to happen over the course of conducting science, conditions that we don't even know about. Um, but we have a responsibility to one another and to society and to taxpayers who, who are publicly funding a lot of this research to increase the, this process's efficiency. Not to mention a duplication of effort can be often really frustrating if you're conducting science and someone else already did this and got it to work, but they just didn't share enough of the details about it. Okay, so what, do we, what can we do about it? Um, for, for, for the source code piece of this puzzle, the answer is docs, tests, version control, and access. Um, scientists, co scientists coders are notorious for not doing these things. Um, this is, and I'm not going to paint all scientists coders with, with, with one brush with this because there are some that are very good at it and there are, it tends to vary um, different uh, areas of science. The norms tend to vary a lot. Um, I happen to know in, like in biology it tends to be not very good especially. Um, that's my, pers my area of personal knowledge. Um, I know in some of like the math, other kind of more uh, math and computer science based worlds it is better. Um, but generally speaking, these things don't get a lot of time spent on them. Okay. So, yeah, poor, poor puppy got cut in the cactus. Um, so in my lab, for example, I want to kind of tie this together with a story. Uh, we have this data acquisition system. So this is the software that records, it does our brain recording for us. Um, we had this legacy system that was written by a scientist coder and it, was, it was worked for years, it was great, um, except that person also passed away, and the, that source code had none of those things um, associated with it. It had, it had no docs, it had no tests, um, and the act, we didn't even actually have access to the source code. We had just got an executable file that was like emailed periodically um, whenever there was an update made. So working on this, extending it, was just definitely going to be impossible. Um, oh, I should say. So here's a screenshot from that one. So that's the old version. And it's a little washed out. Um, so, I get, so I got, positive side to this is I got the opportunity to start my own project from scratch. So I got to pick what tools I wanted to use. So I'll be talking about more about that later. This is a screenshot of the new version. Um, and just, I guess, to kind of explain this a little bit, this is the brain recording here. You put in all your, your input parameters here, and then you record from the brain here. Okay. So yeah, there was no, and there was no even user docs with this. It was merely oral tradition is how you learn to use it, um, which is fine in a like a research lab where you have a steady stream of people with lots of overlap. But if you don't and you want to share this with other people, that you're really stunting your reach with that. Um, uh, not to mention trying to work on it is basically impossible. I don't think I really have to talk too much more about this point to this audience. Um, yeah, and this is how I feel. If I'm on cruising GitHub for something, I'm trying to find out if someone's already written this package that I want, and I see a, sort of a repo with no tests on it, I'm going to like, mm. if it's any, if it's any uh, reasonably large size, I'm definitely not touching it. So just make sure your code has tests. Um, 
Also, testing form, uh, serves as a form of documentation. So it gives examples how to use your code. Um, also, I feel like just scientific um, libraries or um, any scientific code that's going to be associated with research should have tests just as a confidence kind of measure that you can say, OK, I've used this software. I custom wrote this brand new software and it's pro proving this new scientific principle that I want you to publish about. Um, and I also, by the way, I've tested it. So it at least has a, mi a bare minimum check on kind of the um, quality of the code. Not to say that all tested code is good, because we all know that's not true. OK. Um, and also version control. Uh, so when I came into the lab, there was nothing under version control. Uh, and this is not unique either. Um, so having, and not just having things under version control, but having a specific version of each uh, time you publish something or time you release data, you need, and you, or you analyze data rather, you need to have a commit ID or a DOI, which is a digital object identifier. It's a way of identifying, say, t um, a citation um, of, some, of a digital object in other publications. And this could even be just like blog posts. If you're not someone who's publishing in an academic science and you're kind of more interested in maybe doing your own science research as citizen science, these principles all still apply, probably even more so, because you may not have the clout of being behind a university. Um, that is a great question. Um, you, ha you have to basically kind of apply for one on the website. Um, yeah. Can, you can kind of Google it, and it should be pretty easy to find out. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk about Figshare too. Okay, um, great. Oh, oops, oops, I'll go back. Okay, so if all this is obvious to you, and for some of you, it definitely maybe, um, then I then I <laughs> encourage you to um, also harp on these things or just like encourage the people in your life that maybe are less good at these things um, to do them and like, but to do that in a way that makes, use examples or that makes it relevant to them. So I give coding, or I was giving coding workshops to the scientists at work and they were very kind of resistant to some of these ideas because it took up more of their precious time. Um, <laughs> this is kind of, this is a picture I like to show because it can kind of relate and this is talking about, this is version control, specifically with like thesis writing, and kind of like keeping track of all the little different versions and making notes with each other and collaboration. And it's kind of like illustrates for some people. So, yeah. Okay. And importantly is all these things are fairly meaningless if you don't have access to them. Um, so you can, you don't have to use GitHub, but some, having it somewhere online that's open access is basically super important. Because um, this is publicly funded um, Precisely for publicly funded science. I feel like it should be a requirement. Um, it's increasingly with different journals, they are going towards this where they want you to submit data and code with your, uh, with your journal articles, but it's not yet a requirement. Um, so this kind of solved the, yeah, I think it's around here somewhere problem. So like with the, I was actually originally trying to get my hands on the source code for the, um, the original data system. Um, so my boss emailed the other professor and said, hey, can you have the source code? And they kind of emailed back saying, yeah, I don't really know where that is. Um, <laughs> but, but, but a month later, they're like, oh, no, no, we found it. Here you go. And it was half of it. And <laughs> yeah, because the part I was looking for, because was, there was some little part that even though I had already was well into my way of creating a new system, like, oh, I was wondering how the original system interacted with this piece of hardware. So I was looking for that piece of code, and it was not nowhere in the source code they, they got me. I did get a little insight into the source code, though it was like one file of 10,000 lines or something. So, <laughs> yeah. It was. What's your source around? Uh, C++. Okay, so and also to encourage programming literacy. Um, that's because this is only becoming more important if you're a scientist and you don't know how to code, you're probably gonna be start to relying on other people to do that for you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about giving some examples, but basically your, your languages that you're most likely to use. Um, I use a lot of Python, um, which is a general purpose language that has a ton of great scientific libraries. Um, R is great for statistical libraries, especially with like tab tabular data. Octave, um, which is like basically a straight up kind of very um, 
I won't say MATLAB clone, but it has, it's based on the MATLAB interface to basically reproduce all of MATLAB, which is a proprietary software functionality, um, but in an open source package. And also Julia, which is a new language. I think it came out in 2012. Um, it's still pretty new. I was actually going to include examples from Julia in this presentation, um, but then I ended up not because there was like bugs in it, and I decided just like, because like, I couldn't get it to run in the I, I Julia notebook for various reasons, I decided to just leave it out and it gets an honorable mention instead. Um, and resources that, um, that I personally like to use for um, teaching and learning, um, Software Carpentry is a organization that will send instructors to your organization to teach them how to code and it's got a scientific slant. So they'll, they'll use curriculum that is relevant to your audience. And you can even request instructors that are from that field. So if you're an astrophysicist and you want to teach other astrophysicists how to program, they'll, you'll get an ast you can ask for an astrophysicist instructor, instructor and have code that is um, examples that are more relevant to you. Also Coursera, I think is not actually open source, but has a lot of open courseware. So I think that, that can be a really good source if you don't have access, uh, the ability to have instructors come to you. Okay. Okay, so actually doing data analysis. Uh, so I said I use a lot of Python, so when I got to redo the project, I chose to use Python because of the growing um, scientific community behind it and all the wonderful libraries that people are making. Um, the top most being, um, if you do basically, if you do anything numerical or scientific with Python, you're going to be using NumPy. Um, and depending on what you're doing, you're probably also going to be using SciPy if you're doing anything sort of like uh, really number crunching. They have a lot of uh, good functions and things that are very common for pieces of science. Um, they have signal processing and stuff too, it's really cool. Pandas is actually a lot like R in that it's good for tabular data and doing statistics in. So if you, if you love Python but you need something like R, Pandas is definitely your answer. And the IPython notebook is also one of the super great um, things about Python, and actually the, the project is now extending to other languages, called, it's called the Jupyter Project, so it's kind of split off from IPython, and it's being to become a more language agnostic, but it lets you kind of mix in your notes and uh, executable code into one document. I'll show an example of that later. Okay, so I'm gonna give some examples. Um, uh, using some of the data that I worked with in the lab, and I just wanna explain a little bit here about what you might be looking at. So this is a brain recording. Um, it's a 200 millisecond little time recording of, of the brain. And this is called a spike. A spike is an electrical impulse that nerves send to each other to send information on. And so the timing and the pattern at which these spikes happen conveys information. And so that's what we look at in the lab. This is basically our research right here is looking at these signals and then doing stuff with them. Okay, so I've taken the liberty to go through 100 of those little um, chunks of data and pull out each of these times. And then I save them to a CSV file. Normally we actually have um, this data stored in what's called an HDF5 data um, data structure, uh, which you may have run into if you're in the science world. It's basically a way of storing hierarchical data, but it's also, you can, don't have to, um, where you don't necessarily need a database, but you do want to be able to access part of a data file. It lets you pull out pieces without having to load in your entire gigabytes large file. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is what, if I want to get the number of, I want to find out the number of spikes in each time bin to kind of get a pattern across an entire uh, set of repetitions. Um, and this is something that we do. Um, Using pure Python, I can actually do this without even uh, using any of the libraries if I don't want to introduce dependencies, if this is all I need to do. Um, this is what it would look like. So you create an empty array, um, you use a CSV reader that is um, built in with Python, um, and then you just read in it row by row, converting the strings to float as you go. Um, then you can convert, and you can, in this case I am deciding I don't care which repetition they came from, I just want to do it for all of the spikes. So I flatten the array, and then I get the bins that I want, then I count them, I determine the bin um, edges, and then I just print it out, and this is what you get. 
So this is the time bins at the bottom, and this is the number that is in each of those bins. We'll be graphing this later, that might help, but this is just kind of like, this is a little, like a little piece of, a little tiny piece of data, what data analysis would look like for my lab. Okay. If I do this with pandas, it's a little cleaner looking, because um, I can just use pandas that read CSV instead of that whole big long loop where I have to read out each line and convert it by myself. Um, in this case, I'm still deciding that I want to flatten it instead of keeping it in that structure. I'll do it, I'll show you what it looks like if you don't later too. Um, this is just, um, because the data structure was not rectangular, you have to kind of go through and pick out all the NADA numbers that, that they get placed in there because pandas is expecting tabular data. So that is kind of like a little cleanup thing that you have to do. And I should note that when you're doing stuff like this, when you're doing any sort of data analysis task, like this stuff takes up most of your time. Like just reformatting the data, reading it in, all the munging stuff is like 75 to 90% of your time. Um, and then you get to look at pretty graphs and like do a, tweak the cool fun things like 10%. Okay, and then there's also in pandas, there's built in functions to do the bin counting instead of having to do it manually too. Let's, and when you usually use these libraries, there tends to be more efficient. So they've, the, if you install the Python soft, um, scientific libraries, uh, you may notice that you are also have to install, say, like Fortran as well. And that is because underneath all of this, like the fast parts of the libraries are actually running Fortran code. Or depending, depending, and I think it kind of depend with NumPy, it might depend, and SciPy, it might depend. Um, which way you decide to do I think there's a couple ways. There's like Blast, Lapack, or MKL. I think you can choose either. Um, anyways, if that, is, if that made sense to you, that's fine. If it didn't, just know that there's, Python depends on other lower level language code um, to go fast. Um, so that when you use um, functions like this, they can be faster because they are using other tools that are actually just faster than pure Python. So you should use them if you can. Okay. Um, also, R is really nice for this because it's super simple. Um, I'm kind of cheating here and I'm using the histogram though, in this case. It's also because I know R less well. Um, and that actually, oh, I didn't, I forgot to put the output. But basically, it looks the same as the last ones. When you do the histogram, it kind of does, does it for you and you get the um, counts and the bin edges on your own anyways. Um, this is flattening the array, again, like the other ones. So it all looks actually pretty similar. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I was putting these examples together because I hadn't done this specifically for R yet because mine looks more like the NumPy one. I was like, oh wow, this is actually really great. Um, okay, I was gonna, this is a screenshot of IPython notebooks because I'm terrified of technical uh, te demos in the middle of my, pr of my presentation. Um, but if we have time at the end, I can actually, I have this. So this is basically, um, I have an IPython notebook of all of these examples where I go through and explain as I'm going. So this is, who here hasn't seen IPython notebook before? Okay, a few people, good. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a way to kind of, you can have cells that are in Markdown, so that you can make, you can set in nicely formatted notes with links and images or YouTube videos or whatever you want, and in between that has executable cells of code. And it's all one namespace, so you can have your, some initializing bit at the top, explain that, you can, and you can insert um, tech into it so you can have formulas. Um, and then you can have another bit of code that explains it that is the next part. And it's a really great way. Um, I do it with exploring data sets um, and kind of putting code together. And also for education materials are kind of the two best uses I find. Um, generally then I will take code out of here. And then if I'm gonna be using it in say a library or in a, any sort of like package that is kind of in, you can be used in production, uh, I will then take that out and put it into a text file and then have that under version control. Because um, that is, you can have, although GitHub now actually has rendering of IPython notebooks in the browser, which is pretty awesome, um, which I've already been taking uh, advantage of, because you can just like put up a tutorial and like have it under version control and have it show up in the, in the browser. Although version control with the notebooks is kind of messy because they're just a JSON file underneath. And also depending on whether or not like this right here is saved like as a, like the binary is like saved in a JSON field. So if you have the output to come out, it kind of, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, there are ways to make that better, such as like cleaning your output before you remember to put it under version control, but anyways, that is an issue with that. But notebook's great. 
Um, OK, so now I'm going to kind of go over some of the, using the same example, I'm going to show um, different plotting platforms with, um, with, the, with this example and what that looks like. So with Python, the um, most popular and most mature plotting library is called matplotlib. And it is called that because it is based off of the, based off of the MATLAB uh, interface. And, um, and that's partly done in part to kind of try to woo scientists away from using MATLAB, which a lot of them are dependent on. Um, and back to my lab, for the most part, is. And it's actually partly because they're frustrated with everyone in the lab having kind of different licenses. And not everyone can run the code. If we have an undergraduate volunteer, which we have a lot of, they often can't, like, they have to come in to do the analysis, data analysis section, and they have to be using that one computer. Um, so that's one of the things that's gotten us to move to open source. Um, but actually having this light prime library makes it nice and easy, because you can just basically use the same kind of function signature for the most part. Um, uh, Seaborn is another one that is basically built on top of matplotlib, because it, and it's just basically a pretty fire. And it gives you some high level other kind of manipulations that matplotlib can be a little bit clunky in matplotlib. Um, Boca is a plotting library that's good for interactive visualization. So if you're going to put anything on, on the web, if you want to put an interactive thing, um, uh, Bokeh is a really good option, because the other two are, produce basically static images. Um, and I also want to mention a much less well-known PyCute graph, um, which I think is how you say it. Um, it's, built, uh, it's using the QT framework, which is actually pronounced cute if I have, I only discovered that like last fall, and I've said it in my head the wrong way for a long time. Um, and what's great about this is it does, it's for desktop uh, applications, um, but these other ones, especially matplotlib, is really kind of slow. Um, so if you just need to plot something and then look at it, it's fine because you can wait like a second for it to load, but if you need to do any sort of anything online, like I was doing a, building a data acquisition system that I wanted to show, well, we'll say soft real time um, plotting, then uh, PyCute Graph actually allowed me to do that because I tried to do it with matplotlib first and it was uh, prohibitively slow. And I tried to do everything I was doing to try to speed it up, all the little tricks that people on the internet say, like with animation and stuff, were just not good enough. Okay, so let's look at the code. So basically, um, this looks the same as the last time, so I get the all spike times, and then you can just pull up the histogram and it will sort them in. Oh. I took out the part where um, I sorted them into bins myself because the histogram does it for me. So I can just call histogram and the plotting library will sort them out itself, um, which is different from a bar chart because a bar chart wouldn't do that, but histogram is basically kind of like a shortcut to get it to, to do the binning for you. And then you get this nice, beautiful little graph. Matplotlib is great because um, you can tweak basically all of it so you can produce publication quality graphs if that's something you need to do. Um, if you don't know what that means, it's because journals, if you're submitting to a scientific journal, they'll have like really particular requirements about what, um, how they want de details on the graph laid out. So like your, your, your labels, your tick axes, all those things, depending on the journal, can be sp very specific about what they want and you have to be able to tweak them. But if you don't care about those things, then just pick whatever prettiest. Um, and Seaborn helps. So I just put import Seaborn because it is actually exactly the same code as the last one, but you just add the import statement, and it does, it does goes in and just kind of sets the defaults and things for you, so that it would look like this, much more pleasing. It's a little washed out right now, I think, but a much more uh, nice to the eye kind of look. It does have other um, kind of uh, methods that you can call to, to create plots for you that are not included in Matplotlib too. So it's more than that. Okay. Um, so pandas, I mentioned before that it was tabular data. So this time, instead of binning it myself, I'm going to let pandas do that, f take care of that for me. So I'm just going to import it, which is my single read CSV um, line, and then I'm just going to immediately in the next line plot it, and it gives me the plot now uh, um, with the spike times sorted um, by spike number. So this kind of actually gives more information, because I can see that all the early ones are first spike times. And another, depending on what kind of analysis you're doing, that might matter to you, whether you're kind of like getting it, when you're, especially when you're doing an exploratory phase, and you're trying to get an idea of whether or not these are first spike latency times, or whether or not um, uh, they're all over the place. So I can see that they're all here right at the beginning. And that might, I might uh, make a decision of um, the kind of the avenue I'm gonna go down on my data analysis, depending on 
what this looks like sometimes. Okay. Okay, and, and here's the example with uh, bokeh. Um, so they have a histogram one as well, and this one you're allowed to like the minus, if you take the minus over it, you can like zoom in and do all other sorts of stuff, and it has lots of other um, interactivity abilities um, with different types of plots too. Oh, also that they, but this is still allowed, but you can still use it in the notebook, which is great. Um, so I said to, to set the output to the notebook. Uh, otherwise, it would save to an HTML file, and then you could embed that bit of HTML into your website. Um, oh, yeah, I don't have the sample code for PyQGraph, um, but it is actually what I use the most, ironically. Um, so I just included a GIF of the program kind of working um, and this is a histogram of it building up. Um, just kind of see what that um, looks like. So this is like it being used online, not necessarily in data analysis. Um, just to kind of give experimenters an idea of how to, f they use this when they're trying to find <coughs> cells. So they're kind of hunting around for cells and they're waiting to kind of like look for, the, the, looking at the histogram and they're looking at the spike trace to see whether or not they found one or they found two or what the, what kind of where they are in the brain. Okay. Oh, and, and R as well. So this is basically the same thing as the last slide, um, but then I have the plot in it. And that's what that looks like. Okay, oh yeah, an honorable mention goes to Julia, um, because I think it's really cool. Um, it's still super new and it still has some bugs. I have a notebook that I was trying to plot things in and it wouldn't plot in the notebook, and also it wouldn't, one of the variables wouldn't get assigned if I didn't um, put a print statement in or something weird like that, like after it. Yeah, um, it's probably uh, better if you don't use a notebook, but I, that's how I like to like explore things, so I'm very comfortable there, so. Um, also, ggplot2, a lot of people like it. I'm just mentioning it because um, I haven't ever really used it. So it gets an honorable mention just because if, you, if you're familiar with the grammar of graphics, this is an implementation of it. And it has its, it has its own kind of style. The grammar, so the grammar of graphics is a book uh, written about applauding type uh, conventions and style. Okay, so all of this data analysis and stuff is great, but if you don't have the original data uh, to, to use it with it, then it's kind of a little bit useless. So, Although not necessarily open source, I also want to mention um, sharing results. So Figshare, Dryad, and Dataverse are all places where you can post your data online for free. Um, and this, and give, uh, and for open access anyways. And especially if you're publishing something, this is something you should do every time you publish a data, a paper with associated data. Um, having it, having the code available and having having the code available, the version of the code with which you used to publish those results, the data it was used on, online and, in a, and basically linked to, um, will make your, is the, how we make science more reproducible. One of the ways. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Also, um, this can help yourself too, because then you don't have to worry about where you're whether or not like some postdoc disappeared with the data on their laptop. You should be backing up your data anyway. You should have a copy for yourself, but having it online is one kind of great way to like have a system where it's always there and you're never, you're always sure about that. Okay. Okay. So now I want to talk, also talk about citizen science. And so citizen science is scientific research conducted in whole or in part by amateur or non-professional scientists. Um, this, okay, so this is a screenshot of SETI at home. Who recognizes this? Nice. Yeah, so this is from the 90s. I think it was 1999. Um, this is kind of like the first, the like, pioneer in citizen science. Um, this was a, basically a program you could download. It would pop up a screensaver, and it would use your spare processor time. So whenever you weren't using the computer, it would use your processor to crunch the data on some, from satellite data to, that was looking for extraterrestrial life, and then send it back. So you could help look for aliens just by doing nothing. And this was fun and it involved, yeah, you can still do it. Um, this is fun and involved a lot of people. Um, and it's a way to kind of engage people. Um, 
Okay, so here's a more recent example. And this is not the first one, but one of the kind of first super popular uh, platforms to kind of popularize not just using people's spare processor time, but using their spare human time. Uh, so as it turns out, people are really interested in helping you do science research because people really like this stuff. And the first uh, example I want to give is Galaxy Zoo. So this is a platform that is still up. You can go and do this, play this right now still. Um, that allows you, you look at pictures of galaxies and then you answer a bunch of questions about them trying to classify them. And this is because although getting really good image analysis, um, humans still are still better at image analysis than machines are. Uh, and there's a graduate student who was faced with having to classify like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these, these fuzzy pictures and so built a platform to get other people to help him out with it. And they have now like, uh, what does it say on here? Yeah, they actually have over 100,000 volunteers. They've done millions of classifications and there are more than 50 papers that have been published off of the data from this platform. So that is a really good, that's a huge amount of leverage, whereas like one person wouldn't have been able, um, would have taken them, that's like lifetime's worth of work right there, basically. Um, oh, this other one that I thought was kind of cool was a project that wouldn't have even happened if it hadn't been for citizen science, and that is the Snapshot Serengeti, uh, where they actually set up camera, uh, motion sensor cameras throughout the Serengeti National Park, and they would took like 1.2 million pictures, and they got, volunteers to analyze all of the data. They actually finished over, I think, um, um, oh, anyways, it was to study how predators and their prey um, were interacting in this landscape, and they are actually able to figure this out so they can do better park management and just science research data off of this. It wouldn't have even been possible uh, without that bank of, view, of people to sit, uh, sit in front of their computers and say, what animal is this and what are they doing? So that was kind of like the authentic science experience where you get to go and like be like a scientist and you're just doing the data analysis task. The other strategy that people have employed for to success is kind of gamifying this. So abstracting the science behind a game. So the first um, example that's been super popular is called Fold It, and that's creating, you're kind of creating different folding patterns of proteins and you kind of, the more stable it is, I think uh, you get a score and you kind of, and you can actually there's like leaderboards and um, same thing with this other Fraxis one, which is actually genetic variants, where you're actually researching um, genetic variants for, to try to help resist against a fungus that's like spreading across Europe's ash trees. Anyways, these are, these are games where you can kind of score points and you can compete with your friends or you can compete on a leaderboard. And actually Fraxness is published, they're in the process of publishing a paper right now, I think, and they're listing Fraxness players as one of the authors. And, and they're gonna, in their supplemental material, it's listed by score. So if you have the high score in that game, you get your name at the top on a published paper. So you can go play games for science and get published. Yeah, and so this is important, these, this, this, these kind of games or this, or the other stuff is important for two reasons. Um, one is that it's a really great way to leverage people to get data analysis done that would take so um, prohibitively long. And the other reason is because it engages people um, it engages the public in science, which is also important because um, it educates them and it kind of gets them just more um, invested in caring about these things as well. Okay, there is one more um, thing I wanted to mention, which is um, apart from just software platforms, this idea has been extended to um, actually getting um, people to do the data collection instead. Um, as an example, Public Lab, I think they're actually giving a talk right now because um, they were scheduled earlier and they got re um, assigned to this time slot. Um, but they send out like hardware kits. Uh, this is a picture of a kite. This, this got started during the Gulf oil spill in 2010. Um, there was a, like a information kind of blackout about what was actually happening and how bad the spill was. And so a few citizens kind of um, had this idea to build kites and air balloons to go and take pictures over the oil spill to actually gather actual data that turned out to be really valuable. And they ended up um, collaborating, um, I think they stitched it together with, oh, um, map kite, I forget what it's called. Anyways, they, st they stitched the images, images together to kind of get a picture and um, actually collect data um, about the oil spill. And, this, um, and that kind of launched this company and they have gone on um, and they have lots, of, you can go on their website, they have lots of other projects going. And 
Their tools are now being used to gather a huge range of environmental data, anything from canopy loss in Peru to industrial pollution in Spain. And all the software for that is open source too. Um, and so you can get involved in this from an environmentalist standpoint, um, or from a game player standpoint, or if you're a software developer, all these things are open source too. So if, that, if the idea of working on these projects is more interesting to you, you can also be a contributor to any of these. And, and you can help um, contribute to science by just um, contributing software patches. Okay, so let's make science puppies and rainbows and reproducible. Um, so lessons I want you to take away here is document your project, write tests, use version control, and engage and leverage others, and encourage others to do these things too. Okay, that's, thank you. <laughs>